Libraries are nothing new. They have been around for roughly 70 years, and they are used by almost all programs written today. Even the simplest Hello World program written in C++ is using multiple libraries. Some of them you may have never heard of. So what are software libraries and how do they work? Obviously, you already know that they are pieces of code written for you by some other developers, so you don't have to do everything from scratch every time you write a program. And to be fair, most programmers won't need to bother themselves with details of how this whole process works. Well, at least until it doesn't. Then, my friend, you open the hatch to figure out what's going on and boy oh boy, things get a little overwhelming. So today we'll take a look into those building blocks of our environment that let us do our job. So let's start by introducing some key terms, huh? We have multiple different types of libraries and it's not really possible to describe all of them without writing a hefty book. But in a very general sense, we have four types of libraries. So, in order of appearance, we have code generation libraries, static libraries, dynamic libraries, and remote libraries. You see, order of appearance here means when in the lifetime of a program the library comes into play. Let's take a closer look. First, we have code generation libraries. These are special tools that read configurations stored in the code or externally to produce more code that will be later passed to the compiler. Fine examples in Java include Project Lombok, Mapstract library, or tools like Xtext. In C Sharp, we have powerful T4. In C++, there are some libraries that use preprocessor capabilities like gtest. Or some might argue that the whole template system is nothing else but a glorified code generation tool. Static libraries come second. They are also called compile time libraries. And for a good reason. Their code is permanently sewn into our executable during compilation. Machine code compiled from your source will be merged with machine code of these libraries during linking process into a single binary file. Dynamic libraries are a little different. Linker reads them during the compilation to check if everything is correct, but it doesn't actually add those to the code of your program. They belong to the operating system and often multiple programs use the same dynamic libraries. And that is why they are also called shared objects. Whenever a user runs your program, the operating system will check if its libraries are perhaps used by some other processes. If that's the case, it will take their addresses and share them with your process. Otherwise, it will just load them before running your program. Hey, to make things simpler, these libraries have a third name. They are called runtime libraries because they are used in runtime. Fun. <laughs> Lastly, let's talk briefly about remote libraries. These allow programmers to run RPCs or remotely called procedures. As you can guess, remotely means in another executable. While code of such library can run on the same machine, there is a substantial overhead compared to, say, dynamic library. However, all this cost gets justified if you can benefit from distributed architecture. The simplest example is your database. You have your database client, your database server, and they talk over the network. They use remotely called procedures to fetch data. There are whole frameworks to support writing this type of libraries, and one of them could be gRPC or Google Remote Procedure Calls. Today, I want to dive a tad deeper into shared libraries. This is what my recent work for Cisco is currently about. I'm putting one of our services written in C++ into a Docker container, and correctly managing shared libraries is a really huge part of the task. As I have mentioned before, even the smallest program uses libraries. 
and shared ones too. So let's try it. I'll spin up a Docker container and we'll take a look at these shared libraries. For my Docker image, I'm using Ubuntu with built-in Clang 12, my current go-to compiler. I'll add two packages here, PaxUtils and Encursus library. PaxUtils brings some useful tools to analyze binaries, and Encursus is just an exemplary dependency I'll use in my code to color text output. As promised, I'll compile a simple Hello World program. Nothing fancy, just plain string sent to standard output. I can compile this from command line and use a standard tool to list dependencies, LDD. As you can see, there are a few libraries that are used here. Kernel VDSO or Virtual Dynamic Shared Object, Standard C++ Library, C Math Library, Low Level Runtime Library, Standard C Library, and lastly, interesting, LDLinux.so. This last row is a clue to what we are after, Dynamic Linker Library. Wait, what is that dynamic linker? This is the system component that is responsible for finding the dynamic libraries the program wants to use. The interesting fact is that each program decides which linker is going to handle its dependencies. Wait, so are there multiple dynamic linkers? Well, no, fortunately no. In practice, we use one linker in the operating system, but here's the catch. Binaries in Linux follow the ELF standard, and it says that binaries contain sections, and in one of those sections, every binary defines a program interpreter. This is a path to dynamic linker. Such an interpreter resides in the system and is responsible for pulling in all dynamic dependencies, and maybe even read the running program from disk to memory. You could even argue that it is possible to actually interpret the program, as in it could be a raw Python or JavaScript file that isn't compiled. But I diverge, let's get back on track. Okay, but why is this important at all? Well, here is the thing. If you ever get error like this, it means that your dynamic linker is having some issues and you need to step in. In many cases, it is enough to just install the missing package. But if you're juggling your own dynamic libraries during development, this may be a little bit harder. So what actually happens here? So dynamic linker will read the binary following ELF structure and extract information from the headers onto which libraries are required. Then it will search for the right one in a few directories that are cached by the tool called ldconfig. This is why just copying the shared libraries to USR local lib is often not enough. You'll need to run ldconfig after that. After loading those libraries, Dynamic Linker will look into their headers to check if those actually depend on another library as well, as this is also a thing. It can become really messy trying to manually understand all these dependency chains, but luckily we have this Pax Tools package that comes with LDD3Util. So let's take a look at the example with Encurses. As I said previously, we have this very simple program that basically prints out this simple message in red. It uses Curses H and it will be dynamically linked with Encurses library. Up here we have the command that I used to compile it. Let's try it. So let's just compile it and run it. Hey, it's working. Okay. Let's look at those nested dependencies. You'll get nicely structured uh, dependency tree, and you can see that libn curses is actually depending on libdl, and that in turn depends on the linker binary. This is just the tip of the iceberg. If you're curious and you want to dive deeper, read online about the so name and issues like 
incompatible versions of one library in a single binary. This type of problem has its own name, it's called dependency hell. You can try and guess why. I also recommend reading the specification of the format. And that's all. I hope that you enjoyed. If you want more videos like these, subscribe and let me know in the comments. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.